All right, greetings and welcome to everybody who's joining us for Simply Living's very first First Fridays event on city sustainability initiatives in central Ohio. Um, we hope you're staying warm today. It's very cold outside this February. Um, we are asking people to stay on mute if possible during the presentation, but to introduce yourself with your name and your location and any organizations you might be affiliated with in the chat. And we're very glad you're here. Um, also, please do put any questions in the chat. Um, we will go to the chat after each speaker and go through and try to get your questions answered. Um, so my name is Kathy Cowan Becker. I'm the executive director of Simply Living. We're a 30 year old nonprofit in central Ohio whose mission is to connect people to learning opportunities that promote sustainability, environmental justice and our local economy. So you can learn more about us on our website and I'm going to put that link into the chat. Let's make sure it's going to the right people. So your support uh, makes it possible for us to organize programs like the one today. Um, so if you aren't already a member, please consider joining us or making a donation. Um, you can do so at any number of ways. I'm putting four different ways, links to that in the chat, um, an annual membership, a sustaining membership, um, a business member if you happen to own a business and there's certain um, benefits that come with that or just a plain old donation and there's links for all of that. Um, all right, so today we are going to hear from Sustainable Columbus, um, the main sustainability office for the uh, city of Columbus. And we're going to learn about two initiatives that the city is working on, the Climate Action Plan and the Equitable EV Ready Parking Ordinance. Um, so first up is the Columbus Climate Action Plan, and we first started talking with the city about this a few years ago. It went through three drafts before being finalized, um, I believe, late last year. Um, each, uh, the plan has um, five different areas, each with a lot of goals and metrics and action items and a lot of moving parts. But I'm very pleased to say that the overarching goal of the final Columbus Climate Action Plan is to reduce the city's carbon emissions 45%, that's community-wide, not just city operations. And that's what the climate science calls for, but it's very ambitious for city climate action plans. Um, you can learn more about the Columbus Climate Action Plan and download a copy for yourself at the link I just put into the chat. Um, and here to tell us more is Erin Beck, Assistant Director of Sustainability for the City of Columbus. So I will let you take it away, Erin. Great, thanks so much, Kathy. I'm just sharing my screen. Okay, that came up. Everybody can see the PowerPoint. Okay, just shaking heads. So yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for having me today. As Kathy said, I'm Erin Beck, Assistant Director with our Sustainable Columbus team. So I work out of our Department of Public Utilities at the city, but I work with all of our departments here at the city on sustainability as well as with the community. Um, and I'm really excited to be here today along with Jenna to share more about our Columbus Climate Action Plan and some of the exciting policy that our team is working on that supports our CAP goals. So Definitely wanna give a big thank you to Kathy and the whole Simply Living team for hosting this conversation and opportunity today um, and for thinking of us to help you kick off this conversation series. Oops, if I can get my slide moving forward. So a Columbus Climate Action Plan, why do we need one and why is this a priority for the city of Columbus? We all know, and I know this audience knows that climate change is happening as we speak and with the latest IPCC report, it really is unequivocal that human influence has warmed our atmosphere, the ocean and land. So we know that this is having an impact on our community right here in Columbus, and it's going to continue to have impacts in the coming decades. Um, but most critically, we really know that it is our BIPOC and low income communities who are just disproportionately impacted by climate change and who are really the most at risk and vulnerable to its effects. Um, so as we see increased heat, more frequent 90 plus degree days, worsening storms, increased rainfall, these are the communities that are going to be the most negatively impacted. 
So that's really why climate and sustainability is a critical part of our equity agenda here at the city. Um, and just like you're seeing up there in the quote from the mayor, that's why we know that we need to lead with ambition in this space that's guided by science and that's really rooted and centered in equity as we look to be carbon neutral by 2050. Um, and that really leads me into just what is our ambition with the Columbus Climate Action Plan. Um, our North Star goal is to be carbon neutral by 2050, but we also know that we need to significantly reduce emissions by 2030. And so our goal, which we're looking at really as the floor for where we need to be by that 2030 marker, um, is to reduce emissions by 45% by 2030. And Kathy gave a great background and kind of um, what it took for us to get there, you know, we did go through a whole drafting process with the plan. Um, and I just want to point out that in our first draft, we had a 25% commitment. And so really excited that through all of the advocacy um, and conversations with community, as well as with leadership at the city, we were all able to get aligned um, with that ambitious and science aligned goal of a 45% emissions reduction by 2030. And so in the plan, when it comes to emissions, um, we're utilizing a 2013 baseline, which is the earliest that our community began to track community-wide greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that's really just a best practice. All cities, when it comes to their climate action plan, um, it's best to use that earliest time frame that you started measuring. Um, but what I really wanna showcase here with this graph is that Columbus, a majority of our emissions are coming from two places and that's from transportation and building energy use. So the single, single largest sector for emissions is transportation. You'll kind of see that up there in the green slice. Um, but if you look at commercial, residential, and industrial energy combined, that accounts for just under 60% of our emissions here in our community. So that's really significant. Just in that one area, we're getting over 50% of our emissions coming from that building space. And when it comes to the plan itself and just what's in it, you know, Kathy talked about the five sections. That's what you're seeing here. Um, we have five different sections in the plan that reflect the sectors of our community that are critical to emissions reductions, but that also reflect our values as a community. Um, and that's what you're seeing there in the different colored boxes with those headlines. And then there's 13 different strategies within those sections. So you'll see those up there on the slide as well. Um, but within those strategies and sections, we also have 32 specific actions that we're committed to, each that has its own targets and goals that are time bound um, to really help us measure our progress towards our emissions reductions and help keep us accountable. So I'm not going to go into each of the actions and goals because that's really just a lot of content and we only have so much time here today, but I did wanna highlight on the right an example of what you would see in the plan and kind of examples of some of those specific targets and goals when it comes to the certain actions. Um, so that's what you're looking at over there on the right. This is an action from the building section of our plan. Um, and the strategy is around increasing renewable energy. So the action that we wanna take is to increase residential on-site solar. And then you can see that there's specific targets built in that are time bound to kind of help us measure our progress for how we're doing towards getting there. So we wanna make sure we're doing a community solar plan by 2025, that we have 50 megawatts installed by 2030, and that ultimately we wanna to get to 500 megawatts installed by 2050. And then um, I also wanted to highlight that the plan, this is going over to the left side of the slide here. Um, the plan really reflects both mitigation and adaptation strategies. So you'll see actions and goals in the plan that are intended to ensure our community is not only staving off the effects of climate change in the future, um, but that we're really prepared for the impacts of climate change that are happening now and that we might still be experiencing over the next few decades. Um, helping us build resiliency. So you see actions around building a network of resilience hub, developing a resilient buildings design checklist, or around implementing a regional um, climate emergency alert system. So those are all kind of actions and goals we have built in there around adaptation strategies. 
So we launched the plan early in December of last year, and we were really proud to have a variety of partners standing with us from the environmental community, nonprofit space, and from the private sector. Um, because as Kathy mentioned, this is a community-wide plan. This is not just a plan for the city of Columbus and our operations. It's for our entire Columbus community. So it really is going to take a lot of partnership and our whole community getting aligned behind these goals um, and working together to reach um, to reach these goals. So we did have, I just wanted to call out, we had the Ohio Environmental Council with us, we had Impact Community Action, and then we had Kenny McDonald from One Columbus, who's also gonna be moving over um, in the near future to head up the Columbus Partnership. And then along with the release, we did put out a social media toolkit with sample messaging and graphics that can be used. This is actually available on our website. There's a link to it here. Um, so anyone can download these and help us spread the word about our climate action plan. Um, that's going to be really important for us. Just as I said, because this is a community-wide plan, we want to make sure everyone knows what our goals are and what direction we're headed in. Um, and it's really a resource that can be used throughout this whole year. So when it comes to implementation and accountability, kind of where we are now with the Climate Action Plan, now that it's been released. So really exciting. We are planning to hire a full-time employee, a Climate Action Plan Implementation Manager, um, who's going to be really responsible for tracking our implementation of the Climate Action Plan. Um, we do expect this person to be onboarded around the end of March. So that's kind of a rough timeline. Um, we're trying to get these folks hired as soon as we can, um, but that's what you could expect to see is in the next few months, we'll have that person onboarded. We've also established five work groups that are based on those different sections of the plan. Um, those are work groups that are made up of stakeholders who are working in those policy spaces, folks who are going to be implementing and doing the work. Um, but also, you know, these, these work groups really are open to anyone who's interested in that space. We do have kind of certain commitment levels and expectations for work group members. Um, but I did just want to flag that, that we, we do try, we are trying to be inclusive and welcoming of anyone who wants to participate. Um, but the whole idea there is that those work groups will really focus on those sections of the plan, the actions and goals within, um, kind of help keep everybody aligned and rowing in the same direction. And then we will report up to our Sustainable Columbus Committee, um, which will give kind of a holistic update and picture of what's going on with the Climate Action Plan. And then I wanted to make sure that folks know this climate action plan is a living document. So um, there, we are planning to have, do updates every five years and have major revisions every 10 years. And a lot of that is just because we know we're going to have to stay nimble, um, make sure we're staying in line with the latest climate science and really just evolving the plan as our community evolves and changes. And then before I close out, um, just wanted to give some general sustainable Columbus highlights. So I mentioned we're hiring a climate action plan implementation manager, but we are actually going to be hiring six full-time employees this year, which is really exciting. We're over doubling our team and our capacity to be working on climate and sustainability. Um, so I did just wanna flag that. Um, equitable workforce development and energy efficiency Really exciting, you may have seen some of this from um, announcements around our operating budget, but we have $3 million this year to be invested in the Empowered Program, which is a youth-oriented workforce development program um, we're working on with IMPACT. So this would be to help introduce young people in our BIPOC communities, our opportunity neighborhoods to good paying careers in the clean energy space. Um, that really is the whole idea behind that program. And then also um, around expanding eligibility for weatherization and efficient appliance replacement. And then last but not least, we are looking to do a solarized campaign again this year. We're participating in um, a Rocky Mountain Institute learning cohort with the intention to launch a regional solarized campaign um, this summer and fall. And really excited to have Simply Living as a partner with us on that, Impact, Morpsey, um, and of course, Solar United Neighbors. So the city did one last year that was just for the city of Columbus, but um, we're excited to kind of expand this to a more regional capacity this year. 
and help get more on-site solar, um, residential on-site solar installed in our community to help support our climate action plan. I think that was all that I had. Definitely time, I think, for questions. And <laughs> all right, wonderful. Um, so we do have a few questions in the chat. And if you think of any, please, we have about 10 minutes here for some Q&A. I've got a couple of questions too, if you all run out of them. But um, Elaine is asking about transportation. So residential was broken, or I'm sorry, buildings were broken down into residential and commercial and industrial. Is transportation broken down into say commercial and personal? Yeah, so in the transportation space, I'm trying to think back to our goals there. Um, we have it a bit more broken down um, to the city versus um, it's more we have some specific goals that are for the city and then other goals that are more community wide. And for example, I'm thinking of our action around transitioning to zero emission vehicles. So we have a specific action and target built in for the city to have a 100% zero emissions vehicle fleet by 2030. And then, you know, our other kind of targets there are for the community and sort of the private sector fleets that are in the private sector or um, it's mostly for fleets that we are looking to see that. And then we have goals around um, registration that would be more reflective of like personal vehicles that we have kind of a percentage of registrations that we want to see are zero emissions vehicles. Oh my God. So I hope that helps answer that question. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and if anybody has any follow-up questions, please feel free to add those to the chat as well. Um, so another, I guess, sort of comment um, from Becky is um, five years and for an update and revisions in 10 years seems like a long time because things can change quickly. Um, are there ways to update or adjust as we go, you know, that it might be less than five years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I definitely appreciate that feedback and input. Um, I think because we have those work groups established, there's always going to be opportunity to talk about what really needs to be happening in the various spaces and kind of goals. Um, I, I, that to me is kind of the opportunity that exists there. So, right. And yeah, and I think it's just important, frankly, it was important to us to recognize that, you know, things do change quickly when it comes to that environmental and climate space. So at least having some kind of regular um, cadence for revisions and updates to the plan and making sure that this really was a living document was important to us. Because I think very frequently, sometimes we see a plan gets put together and then, you know, maybe it, it doesn't change or kind of really reflect what's going on in the community. And we didn't want that to happen. Right, any number of plans are put together and then put on a shelf and nobody looks at them again. Yeah. <laughs> and, don't want and that to happen. Don't want that. And we've got the working group, so, um, you know, at least there's that. Um, so another question from Elaine is, um, would it be possible to hire interns to train youth for the future? Yeah, so I love that idea. And we definitely have actions in the plan that are related to building um, uh, culture, uh, building a community of climate leaders. I think that is the action that is in the plan. I think it's the first action actually in our plan. Um, and I know our green spot team is doing a lot to lead in that space. Um, so I think that kind of lines up with that idea of around hiring interns or just making sure that we're really training community members to be ambassadors for the climate action plan, for climate action, for sustainability, um, and kind of helping folks be able to take changes, to make changes on an individual level. Um, but then also, you know, when I think of youth, I also think of that workforce development programming that we're working on and making sure that they understand um, there's really career opportunities here as well that can, you can make a real difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the most exciting things to me is the workforce development piece and really targeting the opportunity, like youth in the opportunity neighborhoods with that workforce development. Um, so another question from Eve is, where can we find the job descriptions for the jobs that you just mentioned? Yeah, so 
We posted one position. I do believe it has closed at this point. Um, but as soon as I, as soon as we get, I believe we're going to be posting for the environmental justice advocate as well. And we definitely will be posting for the climate action plan manager. Um, as soon as I get those links, I will make sure that this team to get it back to Kathy and the team um, who have those. And then those would be available. You would get the full description. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm looking forward to those um, being posted. Okay, so we have a lot of great questions here. So Dale asks, what about light rail that would make transportation in the city much quicker and therefore more usable? Um, and that might be a chance also to talk a little bit about Link Us. Yep, I was gonna say that is exactly um, where I was thinking. And it's a great question and it definitely um, is part of part of the climate action plan in that transportation space is around encouraging um, equitable mode shift. And so really trying to get people away from a single person in a car, just you know, driving by themselves um, and encouraging people to use public transportation. So we do have an action specifically related to Link Us, which is the city, CODA, Franklin County and Morpsey really coming together to put together a regional plan for um, I believe what we're looking at is bus rapid transit. I know there's been a lot of corridor studies that have already been done, um, but it's all along that vein of how can we really shift the way that people are traveling and moving in our community. Um, so that's going to be a huge effort that's happening in our community. I know, um, I know Kathy is involved in that effort and um, so is our Sustainable Columbus team, just making sure that we're really incorporating all of the values and goals of our climate action plan in that work. But we do have an action in the climate action plan to have three high capacity rapid transit corridors um, implemented by 2030 and to have eight of them by 2050. Right, and I'll just say that um, those corridors will, will be bus rapid transit at first, but by establishing those corridors and showing that ridership um, and, and getting that will funnel not just transportation along these corridors and those are east broad, west broad, and then northwest, mainly up Olentangy River Road and up towards Dublin. Um, once those are in, that's going to funnel more development, more housing, more jobs to those areas. And then that lays the foundation for light rail, which, which I strongly support um, to move towards that in the future. Um, all right, so Ellie is asking, um, how will major regional changes such as the Intel plant change this plan? Hmm. Yeah, so that is a great question. Um, honestly, I think one of the biggest opportunities I saw as soon as I heard about this new development in our community um, was actually that in a lot of ways it supports some of our efforts in the plan. We do have um, green job goals built into the plan. So seeing that kind of development <clears throat> in our community um, is really exciting. Um, but certainly that's part of our challenge, right, um, is we're a growing community, we're adding population, we're developing, but at the same time, we're trying to slow our emissions um, and reduce our emissions. So um, I think that's just going to be part of the conversation we have to keep having as we move forward with the plan, as we look at those revisions that are going to be coming up in the future, um, but also just making sure that we're really engaging with the private sector to make sure that they are committed and aligned on the clean energy front, on the building efficiency, um, and just with everything we're trying to achieve with the climate action plan. Awesome. Um, yeah, that's this plan was definitely formulated with the idea that Columbus is growing and growing quickly and things like Intel, yeah. Intel yeah. announcement just show that. <laughs> um, okay, so we have a set of questions from Lynn around solar. Um, so do solar installers report panels installed? Um, is AEP working on getting residents to do solar? Can neighborhoods and community groups help? And um, is there a working group working on net metering? Yeah, so lots of great questions here. So on the solar installer front or just kind of the solar 
panels installed and reporting side. So at the end of the day in the city, if someone's installing solar, they have to get a permit from the city. So that's why you'll see in there that our building and zoning services is kind of involved in that solar space because we can, you know, easily track what's going on there by just working with building and zoning to see what permits, how many permits have been pulled and, you know, what was the size of the installation that was going in. And we can kind of break that down between what's more of a commercial scale versus residential. Um, so that's how a lot of that tracking works. Um, AEP, we do have a great relationship with AEP um, and still working with them in this space. So I think it's something they're interested in um, working with us on probably still at the beginning of having a lot of those conversations. So what that might look like um, in all honesty, um, ways that neighborhoods and community groups can help um, certainly with that solarized campaign we're looking to do later this year, I think that's going to be a huge opportunity to, um, I didn't talk too much about how that actually works, um, but basically it's a solar co-op. So residents who are in Columbus, and then hopefully in the Columbus area and region, we still have to figure out what it's going to look like exactly. Um, but basically they come together, people can sign up to install solar and by coming together as a co-op and as a larger group, we can get a better deal on installation. Um, and that's a great opportunity for you know neighborhood groups, community groups to just help push out the fact that that campaign is happening and encourage folks. And then work group, so the net metering conversation, that has been, I'm trying to think in terms of which work group. Those conversations are happening, I, I just will say, and our city's division of power is working on developing a net metering policy. Um, but part of the issue here is that our um, meters are actually not physically capable of running backwards. So the city started undertaking a project to update all of our meters for both water and for um, power. Um, but unfortunately, there's it's just been put on pause because there's a national, I think international even, chip shortage that has kind of caused that project to be on pause. Um, so I just wanna, I, I hope this is answering the question. I just wanna let folks know like that is something we are working on. We want to offer that with our division of power. First, we have to update all of our meters to be smart meters and so that they have that capability. Um, and then we would be implementing the net metering policy. All right, well, we have a couple more questions in the chat, but um, it's, uh, I think we're gonna move on right now and then we can come back if we have time after Jenna's presentation. Um, but let's see if we can, I don't know if I can stop the share to um, bring Jenna on. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, Erin, you want to pull your slides down? Awesome. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for that presentation. And thank you to everyone for the wonderful questions in the chat. Um, so we are going to move on to the next project that the city is working on, which is an equitable EV ready parking ordinance. Um, to ensure that there is EV ready parking, not just in the wealthy areas of town, which is mostly where it is right now, but also in all areas of town so everybody has access. Um, so Jenna Tipaldi is the climate advisor for the city of Columbus and she's going to tell us more. Awesome, thanks Kathy. Um, thanks Erin for, for kicking us off as it relates to sustainable Columbus work. You know, Aaron really framed our work from, from the high level, this big umbrella, our North Star goal, the Climate Action Plan. And like she talked about in a little bit of detail, there are a lot of individual actions as part of the Climate Action Plan. And so I'm going to get a little bit more narrow uh, and a little deeper on one of those specific actions, which is um, the equitable EV ready parking work that we have undertaken over the past couple of months. Um, so to get us started, introduce myself. I'm Jenna Tapaldi. I am the climate advisor for Columbus through the American Cities Climate Challenge. Um, I've been supporting the Sustainable Columbus team since early 2019. Um, for those who don't know, the American Cities Climate Challenge was originally an 18 month accelerator program, um, but all of the great work that Columbus and the other 25 cities, 24 cities that are participating um, have demonstrated the, the program was extended. So we started in early 2019. We go through the middle of 2022 now. And it's really an accelerator program for 25 cities to advance 
specific programs and policies that address emissions in the buildings sector and the transportation sector. So like Aaron had shown, our greenhouse gas emissions inventory is consistent with what we see in most cities, which is the vast majority of emissions in cities come from building use and transportation. And the climate challenge was focused on addressing emissions from those two sectors. And so this is a little bit of a look back just to set the stage around the climate challenge supported work. Um, if you go back to the, the original iteration of the challenge in 2019, we had about seven actions that we focused on. This is the bottom half of this slide. Um, a workforce development program, expanding PACE financing, home energy audits in partnership with our utilities, um, mobility options, increasing the number of e-bikes and scooters around town, um, parking management to ensure that parking is priced in a way that it can incentivize taking alternative modes of transportation, and then that last one of increasing public transit use. Um, if anybody's interested in more details on these specific projects from um, a year or two back, feel free to send me a note. I'm happy to chat more about them. Um, but in the last year and looking forward to this upcoming year, really where we're focusing our efforts are on this EV ready parking ordinance. So I'll get into more detail on that. Um, we're also focusing on implementing the city's benchmarking ordinance that was passed in 2020. This is the second year that we're implementing it. And then looking at broader building strategies. So Mayor Ginther and Columbus signed on to um, a White House the, the White House Council for Environmental Quality Building Performance Standard Coalition that was announced a week or two back, which is a really exciting initiative to get Columbus connected to resources to support our multifamily and our commercial building owners to really deeply reduce their energy use. Um, like Aaron had mentioned, we're also looking at residential energy efficiency and workforce development. And then um, a mobility hub equitable engagement project, which I'll talk about a little later. And we're co-creating an equity index, which is essentially an equity scorecard that can help inform future programs and policies that Sustainable Columbus team um, moves forward with to ensure that any solutions and programs and benefits of climate solutions go to the communities that are impacted first. That's typically our BIPOC and our low-income neighborhoods. So it's a little bit of an overarching of the climate challenge supported work. Now, now I promise I'll get narrow on the EV ready parking work. So what is it and what are we hoping to achieve? Um, EV ready parking is building new parking spaces, garages, surface lots um, in a way that either includes the physical charging station during the construction period or is built in such a way that the parking spaces can easily be converted into EV charging stations in the future. And so when we talk about EV readiness, really looking at a scale, there are three different levels. EV capable, which is simply ensuring that you have enough space in your electrical panel and that you have the conduit that is run to the underground parking spaces. And so this is a way that if you were to want to install a charging station in the future, you don't have to dig up the ground to lay the conduit um, during the retrofit phase. So that's sort of the, the lowest level of EV readiness. And then the middle is EV ready, which is the same thing. You have space in the electrical panel um, and you have the wiring run, but then you also pop up a junction box for an outlet. If you were to put an outlet, you could use your onboard um, charger in your car and just plug into that space. That's the middle level. And then EVSE installed, EVSE is electric vehicle supply equipment. That means that you have an actual physical level two charging station in that parking spot. And so when we talk about EV ready parking and we talk about an ordinance, what we're looking at is establishing a certain percentage threshold at each of these levels that would apply to a parking garage. So you have a 150 um, spot parking garage coming out and you, this is just an illustrative example, you would build 20% to EV ready standards and 5% of those parking spaces would be EVSE installed. What we're looking to do is establish those minimums to be incorporated into the building and the zoning code so that any new construction parking spaces are built in a way um, that will be ready for charging stations. And our goal with all of this work, like Kathy mentioned, is to really ensure that we have charging stations equitably distributed around Columbus and that we're ensuring that anything that's being built now is future proofed. So who benefits from this work? Um, really everybody is the short answer, but I'll get into some details. 80% um, of folks who have electric cars either charge at home or at work. So looking at multifamily housing and apartment complexes is really, really important. Um, folks who have access to consistent charging, reliable charging, are significantly more likely to choose an electric vehicle as their next car. Um, so by ensuring that we have 
widespread access to charging, we're really enabling that access for our multifamily tenants and residents across our community. And then the, the environmental impacts of electric vehicles are fewer than the environmental impacts of gas powered vehicles, no tailpipe emissions. So we're really getting cleaner air, especially in our low income neighborhoods that are often um, have a higher energy burden, they have higher heat or uh, urban heat island effect. And so we're able to pull those pollutants out of the air with electric vehicles. And then from the financial side, looking at developers and building owners, if you install to EV, if you build to EV ready during construction, it's about 75% less costly than if you were to go back and do a retrofit. We, there is an element of future proofing here. We know that not all residents have access to electric vehicles right now, but the price of the vehicles is beginning to come down. And we are, we are looking to ensure that in the future, when those vehicle prices come down and vehicle adoption is more widespread, that a barrier is then not the need to go back and retrofit your building to install charging stations. Um, this is where this fits as it relates to our climate and our equity goals. Like Aaron mentioned, um, this 38% stat may need to be updated with the latest greenhouse gas emissions inventory, but significant portion of our community-wide emissions come from transportation, and that is mostly from single occupant vehicles. We have about a 2% EV adoption rate in Columbus right now. Um, our climate action plan goals say that we need 50% zero emission vehicles, 100% zero emission vehicles by 2050, and we have gained from studies that really access to reliable home and workplace charging significantly increases the likelihood of widespread EV adoption. And we need to make sure that our residents in our low income and our BIPOC neighborhoods have access to this lower cost transportation um, when the time comes. So how are we doing this work? Um, I'll talk a little bit about our stakeholder and our community engagement that we've done so far and where we're looking to go. So we began this process um, really at the end of 2020, um, and I'll talk about that work in a little bit, um, but we began community engagement around electric vehicle access at the end of 2020 and continued with various engagement streams in 2021 and beyond. So we had one-on-one -on -one conversations with probably close to 50 organizations that included traditional developers, the affordable housing sector, community-based organizations, um, underrepresented organizations, community-based groups, et cetera. And we wanted to learn from them. Where do they see their role in the transition to electric vehicle adoption? What are they taking actions to install charging stations at their developments? Are they hearing from their residents that folks are interested in electric vehicles? Really did a little bit of a listening tour. And then we partnered with Common Strategies, which is a black and women owned consulting firm out of Cincinnati. And they held resident focus groups for us last fall. And they, they met with folks from our low-income and our BIPOC communities to understand community needs around transportation. And we were able to use that as a foundation for the equitable EV roundtables that we are holding right now. So apologies for the um, formatting glitch on this slide. But where we are right now is working with a set of about 50 different stakeholders, and we're bringing them together in equitable EV ready roundtable meetings. And so these um, meetings are open to any organization that's interested. If there are folks on this call that would like to participate in them, please let me know. We're happy to get you um, invited. But this is really the first time that the city, as it relates to a specific Sustainable Columbus Initiative, is bringing together this really diverse set of stakeholders from the community sector, from the resident sector, to the development sector, to co-create an equitable EV-ready parking policy. And so... Um, to look back really quickly, I'll just talk about some of our equitable engagement initiatives and happy to circulate these slides around. There's a hyperlink on these, this slide and the next one for the report download for this work. Um, but we partnered with Illuminology, which is a local research company, and this was at the end of 2020. And they met with 50 residents that identify as low to moderate income within the city of Columbus and really just had open conversations with them to understand their interest in electric vehicles how they get around town, what they get around town for, what their interest in a potential electric vehicle car sharing would be. And what we found was that um, some of the local transportation options right now can be time consuming and unreliable. And what residents need is a reliable and cost-effective way to get to opportunities. Essentially people are getting to jobs, to school, to visit their family, um, specifically around the adoption of electric vehicles, the residents that were interviewed, their main concern with purchasing an EV was the upfront cost. So that's a helpful signal to us of we need some supportive programmings to get 
vehicle access expanded. Um, and then the other thing was those that were interested in owning an electric vehicle were concerned about how and where they charge their car, which again signals the need for more ubiquitous charging stations around town. Um, and then again, the focus groups that common strategies held last fall, this was again with residents in our BIPOC neighborhoods. Um, they were looking at overall transportation needs and what residents found that they needed in the transition to electric vehicles as well. Again, sort of echoed what we had heard the year before, which was that the transportation needs to be affordable and reliable. We also found that the benefits of EVs are not as well known in these communities. There's common misconceptions about how vehicles um, are charged, how they're powered, how they drive. And the recommendation mainly to our team was to conduct education and engagement campaigns around the adoption of electric vehicles and then provide financial incentives to reduce the upfront cost of these vehicles. So looking ahead at the equitable engagement that we're gonna continue moving forward with, we're partnering with Impact Community Action. They are hiring three community advocates to support the EV Ready work and the Sustainable Columbus work overall. These will be residents of our BIPOC neighborhoods. They will be paid $20 an hour up to 60 hours a month for six months. And they are really serving as community subject matter experts. They're gonna be the eyes and the ears of the community. They're gonna liaise between the community and the Sustainable Columbus team and ensure that the needs and the priorities of the community are built into Sustainable Columbus programming going forward. The other um, equitable engagement stream that we're really excited about is this mobility hubs build out. So this is a partnership with Clean Fuels Ohio and Columbus Yellow Cab. They are developing mobility hubs around town. These are the first three that are in place. Another three are planning to be live in the next um, six to eight months, I think. And these are locations around town where there will be electric vehicle charging stations, scooters, e-bikes. They're near transit hubs, so they'll be near Coda bus stops. And this is a way to support our taxi drivers, our ride share drivers, and really those that are in the gig economy um, in a way that they, any resident will be able to sort of rent or check out by the hour or by the day an electric car to use either for, you know, DoorDash or Uber Eats delivery or just to you know, drive across town or go to a doctor's appointment. And so this is a way to increase access to electric vehicles and shared electric vehicles, because we understand that um, the goal is not for everybody to have their own car and some people don't want it their own car. And so this enables another mode of transportation that's more environmentally friendly and is not reliant on single, excuse me, um, single occupant car ownership. So I think that I'm getting towards the end here, but looking ahead, um, we're continuing our roundtable series. We have had one meeting so far, that was a week and a half ago. Our second virtual roundtable will be next Wednesday. And those meetings are intended to continue about every two weeks for probably the next four to six weeks. So again, just to reiterate, the objective for that work is to co-create um, an equitable EV policy and the supportive programs to ultimately meet those goals. So I think that I'm over time, so I'm gonna pause there. Um, and see if there are any questions and happy to answer them. We'll also get this link around. We have a website that's up and running for the um, EV Ready Parking work that has some resources to download as well. Thanks, Kathy. Absolutely, thank you, Jenna. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat and um, feel free to add your questions about electric vehicle charging, readiness, um, and equitable concerns about that. Um, a first question from Becky is, the, there has been, I guess, some misconceptions or bad press about electric vehicles and also just a concern about you know, charging stations actually working. <laughs> when you get to them, I've had that happen with my EV, you get to a charging station it's, and it's not working um, or just a lack of knowledge among many consumers, which I think you touched on a little bit. But um, how, would you how do we promote the positive message that you mentioned about electric vehicles? That's, thank, thanks for those observations, and that's a great question. Um, I think what we're realizing is that we need significantly more education and myth busting that is not just centered in our wealthy white communities. Um, and so that involves working with a diverse set of stakeholders on these types of education campaigns. So working with organizations like Impact Community Action and Columbus Urban League and a number of other organizations that are participating in the EV Ready Roundtable really to, to understand what is the right messaging, who's the right messenger, and how do we deploy that. One of the pieces that's gonna support this that we're really excited about as it relates to the mobility hubs 
part of the funding for that is going to support neighborhood ambassadors. And so they'll be somewhat similar to the community advocates, but those will be folks from um, our opportunity neighborhoods who can really serve as a resource to others in the opportunity neighborhoods who have questions about, hey, I wanna rent this EV from the mobility hub for a couple hours to go to a doctor's appointment, but I don't really wanna call some big organization or some corporate phone number. How can I have a trusted resource in my community who has the answers to that? Um, so we're working on getting that those set of like education materials and information packets, et cetera, deployed out to trusted sources in the community who can answer those questions and support that educational campaign. So it's not necessarily coming from the top down, more of a grassroots up effort. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I've seen information and just from experience from owning an electric vehicle, there's almost no maintenance and obviously you're not putting gas in it. So you do pay a little bit for extra electricity, but it's not nearly the cost of gas. It's like a comes out to about a dollar per what would be a dollar per gallon of gas. So, but people don't know that they don't know that there's almost no maintenance cost. Um, so there's, you know, just like you said, um, a lot of positive information that needs to get out and you all are looking at how to get that out effectively. Um, so Dana is asking about the $200 annual registration surcharge that the state of Ohio so kindly put on electric vehicles. Um, and so I guess what, do you have any comments or thoughts about how to deal with that? Yeah, um, as an EV owner, I feel that pain. <laughs> I have, my wallet has felt that pain. Um, I, unfortunately that is out of the realm of control that we have directly, um, but there are, there are efforts that we, you know, are talking about this, this need to coordinate up is necessary for a lot of different actions um, as it relates to not being sort of blocked by preemption or state legislation. So it's part of a bigger conversation um, in full transparency. It's part of, it's outside of the bounds of what I think Aaron and I have control over, but definitely recognize that that is a barrier and one that we want to address and figure out the right pathway to address going forward. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, we we have. I think us in Ohio and Georgia have those are the highest fees in the country. And let's hope we can address it in the next, you know, at the state level. Um, so Lynn is mentioning the community rec centers, um, especially in opportunity neighborhoods, um, could be hubs for mobility and transportation. Yeah, I, I, I love that. Um, we, are, we are on the same page. We're working on a couple different initiatives. So the mobility hubs that we're partnering with Clean Fields Ohio and Columbus Yellow Cab, those are being deployed at libraries in our Opportunity neighborhoods. So I, I'm, the next three, the communities are escaping me, but I'm happy to follow up after. Um, so we'll have those at libraries, which I think is really exciting. And then we're working actively right now with the Department of Public Service and uh, Rec and Parks to identify rec centers and community centers that would be suited to add electric vehicle charging stations now. So those would be retrofit projects, um, but those are, we're, uh, we're on the same page. Those are great locations to have this technology. It expands access to residents directly in those neighborhoods. Um, so we're working on that with public service and a number of different charging vendors at the moment. Great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot more ve electric vehicle charging stations all over Columbus. Um, all right, um, I'm going to go back and ask a couple of the other questions that we didn't get to previously um, for either of you all. Um, so Doug is asking about, um, oh, I lost the, the chat here. Uh, Doug is asking about um, greenhouse gas reductions tied to residential and commercial. Um, will there be incentives for businesses or subsidies for low-income homeowners to, um, I guess, either do energy efficiency upgrades or, you know, say a solar installation? Yeah, so I love that question, and it's definitely something that's on our radar as something that's needed in those spaces. So um, I think where my mind is going with it, we do have an action in the climate action plan around establishing um, a regional green bank. 
Um, so I think that's the terminology that's in the plan, but we're now it's going to be the Columbus Area Regional Green Fund. Um, so that is in process. And the whole idea there is for that to be a funding mechanism um, that's offering financial incentives to make commercial and nonprofit solar. Um, that's kind of where we're focusing it on um, for the beginning of the green fund and kind of for the launch of it. But we do see that at some point in the next few years, um, we would also be adding in um, some kind of financing mechanism to help on the residential side as well. Um, and that work has already started. I think the goal there was to establish the Green Fund by 2025. Um, we're working with the partnership and with partners on getting that up and running, um, hopefully as soon as this year. And again, you might have seen that as well in the city's operating budget announcement that the city is investing $7 million in that regional green fund. Um, and that's 2 million that's going to support nonprofit um, on-site solar and then 5 million that is planned to be dedicated for affordable housing development um, and helping them get on-site solar projects on those affording how affordable housing developments. But also seeing a lot of room for opportunity, you know, if we continue doing the solarized campaigns, you know, how can we weave in some kind of financial incentive with the green bank um, that could be tied to those so that we're, we're making it more feasible for all of our residents and our low income residents and BIPOC communities to be able to participate as well. And if, if it's okay, I, I can add a couple of things um, as, it relates, as it relates to the building side. Um, so House Bill 6, eliminated the electric uh, funding for incentive programs. So when you're looking at incentives, we don't have those through AEP right now, but they do have, I know that they're working on, on passing voluntary um, energy efficiency programs for commercial and probably large multifamily. So a smaller subset of incentives direct from the utility should be coming down in the next year or so. Um, for buildings that are still operating on gas, Columbia Gas still has business um, energy efficiency incentive programs. Um, so I would encourage if it's a large building owner or, or a, a resident, um, those programs are still in place. That's sort of on the incentive side. On the financing side for large commercial and multifamily, um, PACE funding is available, property assessed clean energy financing, um, which is a good way to get a low cost loan to do energy efficiency or solar installation. And that you can also do EV charging with that. Um, and then as it relates to direct residents, the weatherization assistance programs are still um, up and running from impact and MORPSI. And like Aaron had talked about earlier, those are being expanded. The eligibility is being expanded for those as well. Wow, that's all super exciting. Um, okay, so Eve is asking, um, is the city of Columbus looking at the possibility of federal funding for a mo more robust um, city to provide powers to customers or build microgrids or community solar? Like, is there federal funding for this? Well, uh, let me let me clarify that real quick, is that I was I went to Appalachia Summit and they were talking, there was Kate Gordon or something from uh, the energy department of uh, the US energy department. And uh, they're looking at all these different types of federal funding could be used. And I was thinking about our city municipal power and how if we could be get that to be more robust by giving it more clientele. Because what I understand is that we have the utility lines, but we just don't have the clients or the customer for the utility lines. And so what I'm wondering is, is, is there a possibility to get federal funding for the municipal power to be able to deliver more power so that to the, the citizens of Columbus to then get community solar, basically microgrids, to help spur the microgrids by getting customers for that and getting federal funding for our city municipal power. Yeah, thanks, Eve. I think that's a great question. And I think, I mean, the short answer is, are we looking at possibility of federal funding to just help with any and all of our climate action plan goals and sustainability goals is yes. So we are trying to really keep our, um, keep tabs on all of the opportunity we're seeing coming out of the federal government because there's a lot of them. Um, and it's almost a little overwhelming how much opportunity there is, but that's, that's a blessing, right? It's great to see all of these kind of opportunities to help support the, the work that we're doing. Um, I'm not aware of anything specifically that I've seen related to that, but I guess I would say if you're seeing any of those opportunities or seeing grants that you think are good opportunities that fit 
you know, our vision for our climate action and where we're headed as a community when it comes to climate and sustainability, please feel free to send them our way and we will take a look at them um, and, and do our best to, we, we really wanna make sure we're taking advantage of all of those opportunities as much as we can. So the earlier you can send them our way, um, the, the better. Awesome. So we have um, time for about one more question. Um, and Dale has one in the chat. Um, is anything being done on new construction, whether commercial or solar, or sorry, commercial or residential, um, to enact a requirement regarding solar? I guess, you know, that it be solar ready or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I appreciate that question. We definitely are um, in that building space. I. We are having those conversations kind of about what um, what kind of building performance level we need to be at. Um, so I guess just to back up here a little bit. Um, so in 2020, we passed our first ever energy benchmarking ordinance that really requires building owners to track their energy use, which really is going to be foundational for our community to kind of figure out um, taking that next step of possibly looking at a building performance standard when it comes to energy and kind of how energy is being used. Um, I don't know if you saw, we recently Columbus joined a national building performance standard coalition that's coming out of the White House. So really looking at what our best practices in that space. Um, we're probably still, I think a couple years out uh, is my understanding from those conversations based on what's been you know, shared with me. Um, but definitely in the solar space, what we are looking at is um, getting SolSmart certified. So really making sure that our um, permitting practices are the best that they can be and that they're really not throwing up roadblocks for any of our commercial developments or folks who want to go solar um, and just making sure that that's an easy, smooth process on that side. And I don't know, Jenna, if you have any other thoughts on that. I think you've been working on some of that building side yeah. a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks, Erin. Uh, great question, Dale. And again, this is, unfortunately, we cannot, the city of Columbus cannot require a more stringent building code than what the state sets for new construction. So we are operating at a slight disadvantage because of that. So we, we can incentivize uh, a more energy efficient code, like a, a newer um, ASHRAE code than what the current building code is set to. But unfortunately, we can't require it. So what we're doing right now is sort of a gap analysis. The, the I know we're probably at time, but not to get too far in the weeds. If if the state code is does not take a stance on something related to building construction, the city can enact a more stringent code. So what we're looking at is where there are gaps in the state code that we can require a higher standard, and that could be something like building to solar ready. Awesome. All right, thank you all so much. Um, I just really wanna thank our speakers, Aaron and Jenna for joining us today, for telling us about the Columbus Climate Action Plan and the Equitable EV Parking Ready Ordinance and, and more stuff like you know building standards. Um, we really, really appreciate your time. So let's give our speakers a virtual round of applause. Thanks Thank so you much so for having us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, thanks to all of you who joined us today. Um, and I just want to say again that your support of Simply Living makes events like this possible. So if you're not already a member, please consider joining us. Um, I'll put some links in the chat for that, but you can also find that information on our website. Um, so stay warm, everyone. We hope to see you at the next First Fridays in March. We'll tell you more about that in our weekly community newsletter and social media. Um, so thank you again and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.